Okay, so in part two here, we look at the Isaiah text directly. And um, we get everyone get your Hebrew Bibles out and turn to Isaiah chapter 49, verses 1 through 6. And let's let's look at the text, and um, here it is. Okay, so we will be looking at verses 1 and 2 first. And so let's, let's read through that. Let's see what the scriptures have to say. Okay, so it, it says, Shimu iyim elai vehakshivu leumim merahok Adonai mebeten keratni mim ai imi his kir shemi. Okay, listen, O islands, unto me. That is Shimu iyim elai, right? Listen, islands, unto me. And hear people from afar, right? Hakshivu leumim merachok. Okay. And the Lord has called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother. He hath made mention of my name. Okay. And then in verse 2, it says, Vayasem pi kecherev hada betzel yado. Pechbiani vai simeni lechets beror beash pato his tirani. Okay, and he made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand. He hid me and made me a polished shaft that a staff, a polished staff that uh in his quiver he has hid me. Okay, so in the in the Hebrew text on verses one and two, I thought that there were several interesting features. Okay, and the first was that this shimu imi or iyim shimu iyim, and and it says here peoples, right? Or here, here, sorry, here islands. Okay, and I don't, did I say did I say people before? Islands. Iyim you know, means islands in the plural form. Okay, and uh, the King James translates as coastland coastlands okay so the word iyim refers to islands or coastlands and the the significance of this is that it emphasizes this message that reaches not just the people of israel but also to distant nations you know this idea of islands that are far off because you know is israel has no islands right they're on the main continent in in the Middle East, and so uh, the, again, you know, this this is the concept of of this this theme that we see of being a light unto the nations, right? And how uh, the the verse opens in verse one here, here islands, you know, that the the refers to the universal message of these passages to reach out. Not only to the, to Israel, but also to the distant nations. This indicates that the message God is providing here is meant to extend beyond the initial audience and have a global impact. Okay, so the word, uh, this this word, Kerani. Okay, Kerani called me. He called me. Okay, this word emphasizes the divine calling upon the servant of the Lord, who is the speaker in these verses. And so the speaker states that he was called from the, the womb, um, Mibetan, right? Um, right here, Mibetan, from the womb. And that further emphasizes that from the moment he was born, there was a unique purpose and a divine appointment on the life of this person, right? And this servant, right? And this verse signifies that the Messiah was called from the womb, even before he was in Mary's womb, right? In the womb. And we know because this prophetic message is way before Yeshua came, right? And so this is the idea that God has a plan, right? And the verse signifies that the Messiah was called, right? And that God had a plan and this was fulfilled then in Luke chapter 1 verse 31 where the Lord through the angel Gabriel declared the name Yeshua before the conception in Mary's womb. Okay, and now in verse 2, we see the word cell, which means shadow, but cell in the shadow, right, of, of, of his hand, right? Um, and this suggests that the servant will be protected by the Lord, 
right? The phrase cherev hada, right? This this um like a sharp sword here. Kherev Hada, right? And um this metaphor conveys the idea that the servant of the Lord will be a powerful instrument of judgment in truth. And while some might need to, you know, wield a weapon like a sword, an actual sword, to show their authority, the Messiah only needs to speak the word, right? And the Messiah is like a carefully made and polished arrow in the service of the Lord, ready to be used at the right time. And we also note the parallel to the book of Hebrews, which speaks of the word of God being a double-edged sword. And in Revelation, how the sword comes forth from the mouth. You know, and so we get Hebrews chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 19. And so let's look at that. I thought to just include that in the study, we can look at that here. In Hebrews 4, verses 11 to 13, it says, Let us labor, therefore, to enter that rest. Okay, and that's the rest that God that we rest in him. We're resting in the Lord, right? And lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder, asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow. And is, a, and, is and I, I feel this is the most significant part of the verse, right? That and um, is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And um, the reason I feel that that is so important is because we, we, we've got God's word, right? We know what the Lord wants for our lives, right? How to live, right? And the choices that we make. And so are we willing to humble ourselves and live our lives according to this word, or we rather just do as we want, right, and ignore what God has said. And so that's why this the sword is described, or the the word of God is described as a sword, and it is has both a spiritual connotation to an effect on dividing the soul and spirit, and then the joints and the marrow. So, um, the the word of God has this effect upon us both spiritually and physically right and that this this concept of discerning the thoughts and the intentions of our heart what do we really believe you know am i am i willing to give this up for the lord because his word says so am i willing to live this way that god calls me to live you know, and, and the, Hebrews chapter four is such a significant chapter. And it goes, it says, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Okay. And so the idea here is that God knows all. He knows everything, right? About our lives and who we are. We can't lie to him, right? And, and so uh, again, you know, th this is significant. And then Revelation, the connection and we note that the the Hebrew or so yeah the Hebrew text here in Isaiah is speaking specifically about that uh, his mouth is like this double-edged sword. It's about like this this sharp sword, right? And the connection then is to these two verses here, Hebrews four and Revelation nineteen. And in verses fourteen and fifteen, it says, "And the armies which were in heaven followed up him upon white horses, clothed in fine." linen white and clean we note that what that is this is the maasim tovim right the 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 righteous works of god's people right this is this is righteousness and being clothed in fine white linen this is this is significant and then um those who follow yeshua who walk in his ways right and then uh in the first 15 and out of his mouth go goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and that he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the almighty god right okay so we see the power of the messiah here okay and the power of god's word and we note the power of god that comes through the word of God, 
right here. Here's scriptures. You know, the author of the book of Hebrews makes it clear that the word of God discerns the intention of the heart by reason of whether we are willing to submit our lives to the Lord according to his word. And this is why the word of God is called a double-edged sword capable of piercing soul and spirit, joint and marrow because of how a person responds to God's word. Now in Revelation, the comments related to or relating to the sword that proceeds from the mouth of the one who sits on the white horse. You know, this is part of a larger passage that describes the return of Yeshua the Messiah who is represented as the rider on the white horse. The sharp sword that comes out of his mouth symbolizes the word of God, right? Which is powerful and authoritative, capable of striking the nations. You know, um, the word of God is powerful. And the reference to the ruling with a rod of iron signifies the Messiah's reign, where he will remind, he will uh, execute judgment and establish justice, just like what we see going on here in Isaiah. And, and this verse serves as a reminder of the power of God's word and the ultimate authority of Yeshua, the Messiah. Now, in the New Testament, there are parallels to these verses from Isaiah here. You know, we, we looked at a couple of them, and others, other locations, we find Matthew 12, verses 15 to 21. Yeshua is described as the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy about the servant of the Lord. You know, Yeshua's gentle character and powerful message could be compared to the sharp sword that's mentioned in Isaiah 49, verse 2. Additionally, the Gospel of John in, in chapters 1, verses 1 through 14, describes Yeshua as the Word of God that existed before creation was sent to bring light and truth unto the world, right? That, that Word of God came down and tabernacled among men. Right? This echoes the idea of the servant being called from the womb and having this divine purpose. You know, these verses from Isaiah and the New Testament text, they remind us of the divine calling and mission of the Messiah and the power of his words, right? They also highlight the meticulous preparation by God for his servant's mission, underscoring the importance of the readiness and the timing in God's plan. You know, this can be applied to our lives as a reminder that each of us has a unique purpose and calling that God equips us for the tasks that he has prepared for us. And are we willing to do that, to, to walk in what God has prepared for us. You know, it's also emphasized the power of, of the word, right? Encouraging us to use our words wisely and purposefully, you know, for building up, for edifying, not for tearing down. Now, it's also important to note that in Judaism today, there is the claim that the servant in Isaiah 49 here was Israel rather than the singular mess messianic figure, okay? So those who claim this base their claim on several factors okay so let's let's look at that so i listed them here and there are anti-missionary claims that the servant in isaiah 49 is all of israel right rather than a singular individual and the anti-missionary commentators state that there is contextual evidence to prove this, okay, so the context of Isaiah 49 and other chapters in Isaiah often refer to Israel as God's servant. For example, in Isaiah 41, verse 8 through 9, 44, 1 through 2, 45, verse 4, Israel is explicitly called God's servant, okay? And the, the anti-missionary commentators also point out to, or they point to grammatical evidence saying in Isaiah 49, 3, the phrase, you are my servant Israel, can be read as a uh, predicative, uh, predicative, meaning that you are my servant, you are Israel. Okay, and they add that predi predicative um, would add that you are Israel, right? Okay, so, and then this suggests that the individual servant represents the nation of Israel. And then um, lastly, the anti-missionary Commentators also point to thematic evidence saying the themes of suffering, redemption, and restoration as found in the servant songs of Isaiah are often associated with the experiences of the nation of Israel. So, um, 
it's important to note that there are parallels to the nation of Israel suffering and hardship. You know, the point is, is that the suffering comes due to their sin and not for the sake of righteousness or not for righteousness sake. Okay. You know, there, there's a big difference here, right? And in addition to this, we look at Isaiah 49 verses one through two, and there are so many personal pronouns here that uh, speak of the weapon of the servant being his mouth and the word of God. Okay, so the point is, is that the servant will not accomplish his goals by military might, but by the word of God, right? And we note that the anti-missionaries are looking for military might. Okay, and we see how the word of God can both break down and build up. And according to Isaiah 49, this servant would have the power of God's word to accomplish his mission. And we note that the anti-missionary approach is taking this broader perspective from Isaiah, you know, um, the like the various times Isaiah is mentioned in the themes, and, or Israel, Israel is mentioned in the themes, okay, like that's an example. They take this broader perspective in Isaiah as proof that the servant is Israel. You know, the, the point is, is that when we narrow this down and we look at this a little closer, it becomes, um, we, we, we look exactly at who the servant is that is being called and what his mission is, okay? It becomes apparent that the inter interpretation of the servant is not all of Israel. And we also note that the metaphor of being an arrow sharpened and polished or a sharp sword resting upon under the hand, you know, the, these things could also be described of us who are God's people to be ready for use as God's people or how the Lord refines us to be useful for his kingdom. You know, the, the point is, is that the interpretation can vary based upon one's presupposition or one's theological perspective. You know, a major theme in these chapters is of the servant king restoring or returning the people back to their land. You know, the servant king is restoring Israel back to the land of Judah, right? Back to the land of Israel, right? And so the idea, Isaiah, I, uh, the idea of the servant being corporate Israel does not seem to fit, you know, because that's that's like Israel delivering Israel, okay, or Israel delivering herself from her sins, you know, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to consider the servant Messiah as being all of Israel. You know, and because uh, this, this again would almost, this would fall along the lines of not trusting in God, right? And um, trusting in self, you know? Um, now, so let's look at the, the next three verses. We'll, we'll talk about this a little more here. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit. Um, so let's look at verses three through um, three and four here. Okay, so, and it says, the Yomer Li of the Ata Yisrael. Okay, so you're right here it is. You know, and, and say to say to me, uh, my servant, you are Israel. Okay, so th there it is that the anti missionaries are, are um, drawing out. Okay, so so Yomer the Yomer Li Avanti Ata Yisrael Asher Becha et Paar. Okay, so um, and say to me. You, I uh, say to thee, my servant, you are Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And, and, and it goes on, it says, um, it says, Ve'ani amarti le'rik yegati letohu ve'hevel kohi kileti achen mishpat et Adonai uf ulati et Elohai. Okay, so... Then I say, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work is with God. So, you know, again, there, there, are, there are more interesting uh, features here in, in, in these two verses, in verses 3 and 4. And in verse 3, I mean, it, it's, this, it's the entire first verse, right? That... It says, "V'yomer li avdi ata Yisrael asher becha et pa et paar." Okay, so um, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will show my glory. 
And so the word the word avdi here, okay, that, that's this word right here, right? The word avdi, it means my servant and it emphasizes the intimate relationship between God and Israel and his chosen servant. And so the phrase um, in whom I will be glorified, which is uh, right here, in, in you I will be glorified, right? Um, this implies God that God's glory will be revealed through the obedience of his servant. Okay, because, right, to be glorified. To, how do we give glory to God? We obey his word. You know, when, when we obey his commandments, we live our lives according to his word. We bear the testimonies of God. We bring glory to him according to his word, right? And in verse 4, this word, um, this word lyric is uh, to nothingness, okay, to nothingness and or to vain. And then the, the word um, yagati right here is that uh, I have labored or I have toiled. And it conveys this idea of Israel's service may seem futile at times, but God reassures them that their efforts are not in vain, that they... They emphasize the effort uh, and dedication required to fulfill Israel's role as God's servant. And in addition, the it says, I have made my judgment with the Lord, right? And that is, um, that is here. Okay. I have made my judgment with the Lord. And um, it again, this highlights the reliance on God, right? On the Lord, God of Israel, for justice and vindication. And this means that we rely upon the Lord to take revenge and do not take matters into our own hands, seeking revenge or justice, right? And so these verses continue to emphasize the importance of seeking and trusting in God, right? In, in the God of Israel. And again, you know, we note that this verse in verse 3 specifically is a key verse that is used by the anti-missionaries in their claim that the servant is a reference to Israel and not an individual. And so this is indicated by this phrase here where it says, um, Ata Yisrael, you know, you are Israel, right? Okay, so here in Isaiah 49 verse 3, the servant is referred to as Israel. You know, it's something to note that while performing biblical exegesis on Isaiah 49, it's important to take into consideration the context of these chapters. What exactly is being said in the surrounding text, and what exactly is being said in Isaiah 49 all together, right? And itself, you know, the language, the structure, how the servant of the Lord is being referred to, you know, etc. So the reason is that when we do this, the name of Israel is used here not to denote the nation, but to represent the ideal that the nation was meant to embody, right? The servant King Messiah, from this perspective, is the perfect realization of this ideal. And in terms of the Hebrew language, this phrase where it says, um, yet surely my judgment is with the Lord, my work is with God. Okay, so that that's, um, you know, my judgment is with the Lord and my work with God, right? And... This reflects a deep sense of trust and faith in the God of Israel, even in the face of apparent failure or fruitless labor. You know, the term Yisrael is not used as a name here. You know, it's not used as a name here as it is a parallel of the term servant. You know, and, and you got Avdi, right? Avdi, servant. Okay, and, and uh, we note how the Hebrew text is written. It says, it says here that, um, say to me, my servant, you Israel. Okay, so, uh, and then it goes on and it says that, um, it says that in you I will be glorified, right? So the emphasis here is on the function of the servant. The servant will function as Israel to glorify the Lord God of Israel. We note that this is, this is, um, that it was through. Israel, that all of the nations would come to know the God of Israel, right? Because if it wasn't for Israel, we wouldn't know the God of Israel. We wouldn't know the Lord God, the Creator. You know, that's, that's where we get the scriptures from. And um, the question then, then is how can 
Israel here. How can how can Israel? Um, how can we understand this? You know, how the, the how can a nation that has been blinded through idolatry, who is rebellious, going to be exiled, according to Isaiah here, um, show anyone the way to God? Right? You know, when you think about that, you know, again, and this is a serious, a significant dilemma that the servant has come to solve in you know, the servant that is being spoken of here. You know, the servant that is being described here will be to the world and to Israel what the nation itself has been unable to do. You know, the emphasis is on the function of the servant along with the surrounding emphasis on the singularity of the servant as an individual. And this must be considered, right? And rather than God destroying Israel, he brings his Messiah to lead and to guide Israel back to the Creator God into his holy and righteous ways. Okay. And so the surrounding passage suggests an individuality which, which helps to interpret the meaning of Isaiah 49.3. And again, you know, you think about this for a second because when you when we consider this question on how can a nation that has been blinded through idolatry and rebellious that is being exiled due to these sins right how can this nation deliver itself right and it's because god is calling a servant a singular servant a servant king messiah to deliver israel right and because uh, it's not israel delivering israel it is the servant king messiah delivering israel and so this this makes more sense theologically and it makes more sense based on the context of all of these scriptures now um when we look at the new testament text regarding these these scriptures you know there are a few parallels and so let's look at those here and we see here uh themes in the new testament that parallel verses three and four okay so first is in matthew 12 verses 17 to 21 this passage quotes isaiah 42 verse 1 through 4 which contains similar themes of the servant of the Lord being chosen in bringing justice. And in, in, in Acts 13, verses 46 to 47, Paul and Barnabas declare that they must first preach the gospel to the Jews, fulfilling the mission of being a light to the nations that's mentioned in Isaiah 49, verse 6. And then in Philippians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15, this passage encourages believers to work out their salvation, emphasizing the importance of obedient service to God, just as Isaiah 49 verses 3 through 4 emphasizes Israel's role as God's servant. And in Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 through 6, these verses declare Yeshua as the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Okay, so this parallels the idea of Israel being chosen as God's servant and being a light to the nations, right? In Isaiah 49, verses 3 through 4. So, in addition to these things, the idea of a servant who glorifies God through his actions can be seen in passages such as John chapter 13, verses 31 to 32, and John 17, verses 1 to 54. And so these passages reflect the theme of glorifying God through service and obedience, which is a key aspect of a faithful servant. Right? And in conclusion, the interpretation and application of these scriptures can vary, but generally emphasize the importance of faithfulness and service and the glorification of God, right? even in the face of adversity. So the, these themes are not only relevant in the context of the scriptures, but also in our daily lives. They encourage us to remain faithful and committed to our values and beliefs, even when faced with challenges or setbacks. They remind us that our worth is not determined by worldly success or failure, but by our relationship with God and our commitment to serving Him. And they also speak to the importance of believing in the Messiah of God and following His instruction for our lives. Okay, so um, the last, the last two verses here, we're going to look at our verses five and six. Okay, so. Let's see what it has to say. So it says, um, the Ata Amar Adonai Yotsri mi beten le evedlo le shovev Yaakov alav the Yisrael um lo ye asef the 
הכבד בעיני אדוני אלוהי היה עוזי. Okay. So, and now says the Lord that formed me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob to him. Again, you know, through, though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength, my Uzi, right, my strength. And then, in verse 6, it says, The Yomer Nakel Mihot Mihotha Li Eved Lehakim Et Shivtai Yaakov Unzirei Yisrael Lehashiv Un Taticha Le Orgoim Lichyot Yeshuati Ad Katse Haaretz. Okay, so and he said it is a is it a light thing that you be my servant to raise up the tribes of Israel and to restore the preserved of Israel? I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, and you may be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. So, you know, Isaiah 49 verses 5 through 6 contains language that describes being formed from the womb, okay? And that is, um, Yotz, Yotz, Re, Mebet, and you formed me from the womb, right? And we note that God's making a statement, and it says, uh, it says here, and, and now says the Lord, said the Lord, that formed me from the womb, okay? And he, he's, God is making this statement indicating that the Lord God has a plan and that he formed the Messiah in the womb to for a purpose, right, to deliver Israel and to be a light unto the world. And in the biblical text, there are two prophets in the Bible who specifically mentioned being formed from the womb, okay? So um, I thought that was an interesting thing. That I had just had a thought. It's like, well, how many people speak of being formed from the womb? Okay, and so I did a search, and I found that there were two. Okay, and Isaiah and Jeremiah, right? The prophet Jeremiah, um, and Isaiah. Okay, so in Isaiah, or sorry, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter one verse five, God says to Jeremiah, "Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations." That's heavy, right? That's significant. You know, so this verse emphasizes God's foreknowledge and purpose in Jeremiah's life, even before he was born. Okay, and then in Isaiah 49, verse 5, our verse, it's Isaiah is spoken of as being formed in the womb to be God's servant, you know, or as the servant king, right? Being God's servant. And this verse highlights God's sovereignty and plan in the servant Messiah's life from the very beginning. You know, not... Isaiah wasn't the servant king, you know, it is this, this one that is being promised, right? And these verses, or these, these things, you know, Isaiah 1, 5 and Isaiah 49, 5, um, they underscore how the Lord God is active in the lives of his prophets, even before their birth. You know, the God, the, the Lord God has a plan and brings that plan to pass right and so these verses they emphasize the divine calling and the purpose of these prophets and which are established by god himself and isaiah is speaking of the servant messiah as a prophet and as a king right and we know that yeshua according to the new testament was both a prophet and a king right and so um these these things they remind us remind us of god's purpose and plan in our lives as well, and, and the unique roles that each of us can um, are called to fulfill. We note how the New Testament parallels, such as Galatians 1.15, where Paul says, But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased. Okay, so Paul uses this verse, and just like the prophets believed that he was set apart for God's work, from before his birth okay so um it's important to note that paul was not traditionally classified tradition not traditionally classified as a prophet his role in spreading the message of the messiah aligns with the prophetic tradition of speaking god's truth okay so um in the hebrew text on isaiah 49 verse 5 
the word evid servant is uh le evid right right here um is used to describe the relationship between the servant and the lord the servant is dedicated to serving the lord's purposes and will not be rejected by him the word shovev right um let's shovev here um this word means to turn back or to restore and it implies that the service mission is to bring the people of israel back right to their covenant relationship with god in both faith and faithfulness and again you know you see here yaakov mentioned and jacob right and um it says uh, it says, Leshovev Yaakov Elav, Elav. Okay, so bring Jacob to me, you know, back to me, unto me, you know. And so this servant's mission was to bring the people of Israel back to this covenant relationship with God and faith and faithfulness. And Yaakov represents the patriarch Jacob and is often used as a reference to the nation of Israel and as the 12, the 12 tribes, right, descending from his 12 sons. And we note also then Yisrael is mentioned, right? It, right here, you know. So Israel is mentioned again and used interchangeably with Yaakov, right? To make the distinction that the prophetic word is to the nation or to the physical land, right? God restoring his people back to the land of promise, right? And in the word Uzi, my, my strength here, um, or um, this, my strength, it emphasizes the Lord's role in empowering and supporting the servant in his mission. You know, the word um, light or speaks to like le or goyim, you know, for light unto the nations, right? The, the word light speaks to the, of the servant being called to be a light to the nations, meaning that this mission is not only to restore Israel, but also to bring salvation and knowledge of God to the Gentiles, to so those who do not know the Lord, right? So in addition to this, there are New Testament parallels to these, these two verses, 5 and 6. And, for example, in Matthew 12, verse 15 and 21, Yeshua is portrayed as the servant who is called to bring healing and salvation to the people, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. In Acts 13, verses 46 to 47, Paul and Barnabas declare that they had been set apart, or they've been, sorry, they've been sent to the Gentiles to be a light for the nations, again, echoing these words from Isaiah, right? And in John 8, verse 12, Yeshua refers to himself as a light of the world, which parallels the idea of the servant being a light to the nations, like what we read in Isaiah 49, verse 6 here, and in Acts 26, verse 18. You know, Paul's mission to the Gentiles is described as opening their eyes, turning them from darkness to light. You know, so we see these similar, similar things bringing them unto the kingdom of God, you know, similar to the mission of the servant, according to Isaiah 49, and the light to the nation's metaphor. You know, so again, these scriptures generally emphasize the importance of faithfulness and service and glorification, glorification of God, even in the face of adversity, okay? So it doesn't matter what's happening around us and or to us, right? We live our lives according to God's word, right? And there, there's something important to note here in verses 5 and 6 concerning the restoration of Israel and the servant being spoken of here that the anti-missionaries miss or they're unwilling to recognize because it goes against the agenda and what is that agenda that that is a their agenda is to say that Yeshua isn't the Messiah of God okay so um there is an interesting point that's based upon the context of these verses and I had mentioned this in briefly before in these verses we are being told the servant is called to restore Jacob right to to um Leshovev, right to return Jacob Yaakov unto the Lord and to gather Yasef to gather them right and so this this Isaiah 49 here in verse 5 and 6 here are emphasizing that the servant is to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to be God's salvation unto the ends of the earth. Right here. To be my salvation, ad right, unto the ends of the earth. Okay. And so this 
the, these statements here, these two verses right here, they make any kind of collective understanding of the servant quite difficult. You know, as referring to the servant as being all of Israel, as opposed to a singular messianic figure, right? The anti-missionaries claim the servant is all of Israel, okay? And the reason this is difficult based on this text is because Jacob can't restore Jacob, right, to a right relationship with God anymore that Israel can restore itself to Judah from Babylon. Okay, so these verses eliminate the possibility that the prophet being referred to here is a collective all of, of Israel. We note how Israel could not restore herself just as Cyrus was needed to restore Israel to Eretz Israel, to the land of Israel. So too, the servant king Messiah is needed to restore the people to this right relationship with God. Right? And it's important to note this since the major, the major problem was not the captivity in Babylon, but it was literally an, an, an estrangement from the God of Israel that had led to these events, right? They were they were steeped in idolatry. They were um, doing their own thing. They were um, going through the motions. They they um, were unconcerned with the ways of God and, and what He had called uh, His people to be, how they how to live, right? And so they were unfaithful. And so this is why uh, I say that there was this estrangement from God. That was taking place that Isaiah is prophesying about that will that will take place in in the book of Jeremiah with Babylon being brought and exiling the nation as a result of their sins right and their unrepentant sins and so this is why God through Isaiah has been calling the people over and over and over again to turn from your idolatry and trust in the God of God of Israel don't trust in yourself don't trust in the nations trust in the God of Israel and Isaiah says this over and over again. And again, this is related to the relationship that one has with the Lord God Almighty, you know, the God of Israel, the Creator, right? The function of the servant was to help restore that relationship and guide people to walk according to God's holy and righteous ways, right? So the function of Yeshua, right, in the New Testament text, what does he say? You know, he it says that he kept Torah. He fulfilled it perfectly, right? And what does he say? He tells us to walk in his footsteps, to follow after him, to pick up our, take up our cross, meaning that we crucify ourselves. We kill our, our desires and our lusts and, and whatnot, and we submit to the will of God according to his word, and we live and we bear the testimony of God and we bring glory to his name. You know, this, this, is, what, this is how Yeshua calls us who he calls, this is what he calls us to be. This is how we are called to be. The children of God. We bring glory to his name according to his word. And we walk in the footsteps of the Messiah, right? And we, we strive for the righteousness of God. You know, we sin. You know, we fail. We repent. And we uh, perform teshuvah, you know, repent, right? Teshuvah. And then we, we seek God for his forgiveness. And then we, uh, in the Messiah, right? And then we continue to seek the righteousness of God. You know, we continue striving to live our lives according to his word. You know, this is what it means to be a child of God. You know, and, and this is what Isaiah 49 is speaking of here in verses 1 through 6. Okay, so that's what I had for the, uh, the study for part 2. Let's next look at part 3 and see what... Uh, let's look a little closer at the Aramaic Targum and see what the rabbis have to say concerning all of this stuff, okay?